Yes, Shinovni Pani Panove. I'll be speaking tonight, as you've heard, about Canadian ethnic politics and Canadian policy toward the USSR's Ukrainian question, as I call it. Now, I'd just like to proceed my formal presentation with a brief number of slides to give you some background um, to this subject. Uh, the first uh, immigration of Ukrainians came to Canada from the province of Galicia, Crown Land it was called, in the Austrian Empire. And they settled in Western Canada. This map is taken from the Encyclopedia of Ukraine and it, it shows the, uh, where the Ukrainians actually uh, moved to when they came to Canada, where they settled. And they settled in this large arc all across the western prairies because they were primarily farmers. Uh, they were um, peasants in the old country, villagers, Solyane. And they uh, mostly settled on homesteads. And um, so that set the tone for the first immigration of Ukrainians in Canada. They came, as I said, from this province of Galicia. It was actually called the, the Crown Land of Galicia and Lodomeria. And uh, the vast majority came actually from one small part of, oh my gosh, where, where am I going? Yeah, one small part of this Yeah, there it is, of this, in this corner right here, around the towns of Borshchiv, Chortkiv, Zalishchike, and Husyatin, Ternopil Oblast today. 90% of them came from that small area, probably because Ivan Franco did a speaking tour of that area in the 1890s and uh, whipped up a lot of uh, enthusiasm for Canada. We don't know for sure. So. Uh, the crown land of Galicia is here. Today it forms the western part of the Ukrainian state. You can see this uh, map comes from uh, the uh, Illustrated History of Ukraine by Paul Robert Magachi. The, uh, the tinted part is uh, ethnographic territory of the Ukrainian people and you see, can see it extends beyond the uh, political borders of Ukraine. And uh, so that was the basic situation at, at the start of the um, Ukrainian immigration to Canada. Now, I wanted to show you at least one document from those times. And uh, I had one in my private uh, archive. And that was the passport, the uh, imperial passport, the imperial Austrian passport of my grandfather. Andrei Primak. And you can see on the first page here his, uh, his name written in Latin letters, probably by a Polish scribe in the administrative office. And below that, I can't make, that, make out that, um, that next line. But the following one says Koszulivsi. That's the name of the village that he came from, in the district of Zaliszczyki, in the crown land of Galicia. The second page is a physical description of my grandfather. And down at the bottom, you can see his, uh, his um, um, signature signed in Cyrillic in the Ukrainian Cyrillic of Old Galicia. So that even at that time, people were uh, educated enough to, to know that, that form of Cyrillic. The final page with a stamp on the top showing a picture of Franz Josef I, says that this passport is good for, tra for uh, travel to Canada and is dated April 8th, 1910. And he arrived in Canada later that spring. So anyhow, that's the general background of myself. And that's how the Ukrainian immigration to Canada started. And it went through many different phases, and I'm going to describe them this evening. So, across the 20th century, the Ukrainian Canadians formed one of the country's largest and most high-profile ethnic groups. 
Under the previous names Galician, a geographical political term, and Ruthenian, a more ethno-religious term, in the period from 1896 to 1914, they had become Im immigrating to Canada in great numbers. The Canadian government wanted skilled agriculturalists to settle Manitoba and the Northwest Territories, which had always been sparsely populated, and the native inhabitants of which had been devastated by the introduction of new European diseases, to which they had no immunity. Now, as well as this, there was a problem with the United States, which was looking across the border with envy at those empty lands on the prairies. The United States had a strong expansionist um, um, policy, and at that particular time was um, actually at war with Spain and would annex um, Spanish territories in the Caribbean and uh, the Philippines as well. So that was going on at that time, and it had a history before that of annexing Mexican lands and before that, uh, Alaska. So the British government and the government of Sir Wilfrid Laurier here in Canada were, were a little bit afraid that the Americans would uh, seize Western Canada if it were completely empty, and they welcomed these settlers to, to, the, to, 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 this, to the country. Now, um, these settlers, as I said, came from Galicia, and both groups were generally called Galician, both the Bukovinians and the Ukrainians. And um, they uh, settled this lightly trade um, poplar belt, it was called, along that arc that I showed you on, on the prairies. Even before 1914, the prairie provinces of Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta were electing to office school board members, municipal reeves, and even a handful of members of provincial legislatures of Ukrainian origin. In the 1890s, a few had even volunteered to join the Canadian military force that was fighting in the Boer War in South Africa, a little known fact. So it was part of the British Empire. They fought in the British Army in its imperial wars. In fact, war and revolution in Europe brought enormous ch changes to the Galicians in Canada. They were immediately forced to distance themselves from their former Austrian sovereigns in Europe and could not refuse loyalty to their new ones in England and British North America. But still there were problems. On the very eve of the empire's empire entry into the war against the central powers, the major religious leader of the Galicians in Canada, Bishop Nikita Butka, primate of the Ruthenian Greek Catholic Church of Canada, responded to Austrian custom by urging the settlers to be faithful to their Habsburg sovereign in Europe. And when shortly later, Britain entered the war on the opposite side against Germany and Austria, the bishop had to swift, swiftly change his mind, change his policy. So he issued a statement saying, that uh, his church and the uh, Ruthenians in Canada, as they were then called, supported, quote, the British nation. This was very disconcerting for the bishop and his uh, disoriented flock. Then, all recently arrived immigrants from enemy countries were compelled to register as enemy aliens and report regularly to the authorities. Several thousand Ruthenians, mostly itinerants, the unemployed, those seeking to travel to the neutral United States, but not so much those in isolated uh, um, homesteads, were interned in special work camps in Quebec, Ontario, and British Columbia. In 1916, Anglo-Canadian native, nativist sentiment forced the abolition of the bilingual school system, Ruthenian English, in the province of Manitoba, and Saskatchewan and Alberta followed suit. Now, you can just imagine if this had not happened. There was actually a bilingual Ruthenian English school system in Manitoba. Every child had the right to study in the Ruthenian language if they so wanted and if their parents so wanted until the First World War. What would have happened if that had survived? Anyhow, in 1916, Anglo-Canadian nativist sediment forced the abolition, okay. And then in 1917, 
The Wartime Election Act took the vote away from enemy aliens, as they were called, naturalized since 1902, which was the majority of Ukrainians by that time, and gave it to the m mothers and sisters of serving soldiers, who were mostly English. All this had a debilitating effect upon the Galician settlers and re revealed how little they then mattered to the powers that be in Canada. Now, from Galician to Ukrainian. Moreover, the politics of the war and the revolutions in Europe that followed put other pressures upon the Ruthenians in Canada. The collapse of the Russian and Austrian empires and the rise of new states on their ashes complicated matters for the former settlers, who were just beginning to move into the towns and cities. The rapid rise and fall of new Ukrainian national governments in Kiev and the former Galicia gave their compatriots in Canada a new sense of national identity and patriotism that they had hitherto not possessed, or rather not possessed to the same degree. This was publicly marked by the change in name that then occurred among them, as they were ever more strongly identifying themselves as Ukrainians. After all, those new national governments in Europe, though ephemeral, all bore the new name Ukrainian. And even the Soviet Socialist Republic, the, US, the Ukrainian SSR that replaced them, did as well. As most Ruthenians in Canada had originated in Austrian Galicia, it was the Western Ukrainian National Republic whose government by 1920 was chased into exile by a better equipped Polish army that most concerned them. This government in exile set up shop in Vienna. In the 1920s, it had two representatives in Canada who tried to establish diplomatic relations with the Dominion government and influenced Canadian opinion on the Ukrainian question. These diplomats were the former Lviv pedagogue Ivan Boberski and the writer Osip Nazaruk. Both men were talented individuals who submitted memoranda to Ottawa and tirelessly propagated the Ukrainian cause in Canada. Their effect on the Canadian government policy seems to have been negligible. But there can be no doubt, no doubt at all, that they did raise uh, national consciousness among the old Ruthenian population of Canada. A great deal of money was raised for the Western Ukrainian National Republic, and by the early 1930s, the old names, Galician and Ruthenian, were disappearing from the census, and, uh, and, the newly des and a newly designated Ukrainian Canadian community had been formed. Indeed, even the Canadian Communist supporters of the USSR, many of whom were once upon a time Ruthenians, were enthusiastic about the communist experiment and its first successes in Ukraine, and they pointed to the national achievements of the citizens of the Soviet Ukrainian public in literature, education, and scholarship, which from the mid-1920s were to some extent possible in the soon-to-be-standardized Ukrainian language. Now, the interwar period, I'll say a few words about the interwar period. However, Western Ukraine, or before I do that, let's just take a look at this gentleman here. Mikhailo Zhushevsky, probably known to most of you, was the first president of the Ukrainian Republic in Eastern Ukraine, Central Ukraine, the Ukrainska Narodna Republika. And uh, it was governed and formed by the Ukrainska Central Narada, the Central Ukrainian Council in Kiev during the revolution and evolved from a kind of um, ad hoc parliament into the national government of an independent state at, by the beginning of 1918 through four declarations called universals, the most famous of which is the fourth universal, which declared the sovereignty of the Ukrainska Narodnya Respublika. So most of you are already familiar with that, I'm sure. So anyhow, that's Frushevsky, great scholar, and I chose this picture because, uh, because of the books. This is his personal library in, in, his, uh, in his home. He loved books, uh, and he was a tireless man. Uh, uh, he got up early every morning, 6 o'clock in the morning, started work, 
had lunch with Yvonne Franco in the, in, in, in the, um, in the middle of the day and uh, Franco had breakfast, had his breakfast with him because he slept in. And uh, then he worked all afternoon till about uh, two o'clock in the afternoon. Then he went to the university, lectured, came home, had supper and worked again until late at night. And the story goes that nobody knew when he slept because he seemed to be always working. So that's uh, Mikhail Hrushevsky. However, Western Ukraine, as Galicia and its immediate neighbors were then called, now largely fell under the control of the new Republic of Poland, which though not a totalitarian state like the USSR, remained an authoritarian policy that denied its large Ukrainian minority, about 16% of the total population of the Republic, the most basic national rights, even those in education and politics that had been acquired with great difficulty under the Austrians. Consequently, in Canada, the Ukrainians now sought concessions from Warsaw rather than from Vienna, as in the past. Two issues concerned them. Firstly, the matter of the immigration of Ukrainians from Poland, the new Republic of Poland, to Canada. And secondly, the issue of the activities of Ukrainian nationalists in Canada in favor of Western Ukraine's independence from Poland. The first issue was temporarily settled in 1925 with the conclusion of the Railways Agreement between the Dominion government and the Republic of Poland. It encouraged immigration from Poland to Canada and allowed the Canadian Railways to handle it. <clears throat> the second question had to do with Ukrainians agitating for independence uh, in Europe, but agitating here in Canada. And this faced the government of Mackenzie King. Mackenzie King um, was approached by the Polish um, diplomats in Canada. They had a consulate general in Montreal and they had a, um, a consul, consulate here in Winnipeg as well who kept an eye on the Ukrainians in Canada. There were not, were not that many Poles, but there were an awful lot of Ukrainians. And the Polish um, uh, government kept a close eye on the Ukrainians in Canada and um, reported back to, to Warsaw. And Warsaw gave instructions to its embassy in London and, and its uh, consulates here in Canada to approach the Canadian government and ask them to control the Ukrainians in Canada who were agitating against the Polish government because they, uh, they were accused even of uh, financially supporting terrorism within Poland. The government of Mackenzie King uh, received these, these uh, applications by the Polish government and basically rejected them, saying that the um, Ukrainians uh, in Galicia were promised independence, well, not independence, but autonomy, national autonomy, according to the uh, agreement of 1923 of the international ambassadors. And they didn't do that, and so therefore the Ukrainians had the right to protest. So that, that was the end of that, pretty much. So although the Second World War, we go on to the Second World, although the Second World War began with German and Soviet collaboration in the partition of Poland, which nearly de facto made these two totalitarian powers allies against the Polish Republic, and somewhat less so against the British Empire and against France, Hitler's surprise attack on the USSR in June 1941 reversed the situation. And from 1941 to 1945, the Grand Alliance to defeat Germany brought full establishment of diplomatic relations between Canada and the Soviet Union. And there you see, this was the um, most widely read newspaper in Canada, Ukrainian newspaper in Canada at that time, called Kanadiski Farmer. It was the first. It was um, owned by a Winnipeg businessman named Dojacek, who was a, a Czech back, of Czech background, and ran the paper as a business enterprise. But his uh, editor was uh, very, very conservative, a supporter of the Hetman Party in Europe. And uh, you can probably tell that by looking at the front page. This is the front page uh, right, that appeared right after Hitler's surprise attack on the Soviet Union on June 22, 1941. So this is the, the same week, later in the week. Um, and it shows these four gentlemen, whom you can all rep recognize. I'm sure there's Hitler at the top. There's uh, Marshal Timoshenko right in the middle. 
He was one of the few uh, uh, marshals of the Soviet Union who survived the Stalin purges in 1937-1938. Below him to the left is uh, Vyacheslav Molotov, the foreign minister of the Soviet Union. And down at the very bottom, we all know who he is, Uncle Joe, as he was known in North America. So, um, yeah, so when diplomatic relations were established between the Soviet Union and, and the Dominion, it was agreed that uh, the Soviets would uh, be allowed to set up an uh, embassy in Ottawa and a consulate in Montreal. The Canadians would be allowed to, to set up an embassy in Moscow and a consulate somewhere else. The Canadians did send up, a, uh, send up a, uh, a, an embassy in Moscow, but they did not set up uh, a consulate anywhere else. And this was politically significant because uh, with time, uh, the Ukrainians became more and more vociferous in expressing desire for a consulate, Canadian consulate, to be set up in Kiev, the capital of the Soviet uh, Ukrainian Republic. And of course, it was the second most important, so it was logical to have a consulate there, especially in view of the large Ukrainian population here in Canada. <clears throat> now, the situation at this time in Canada was precarious for a number of, of uh, Ukrainian organizations. There was enormous uh, pressure upon the Ukrainians in Canada to toe the party line with regard to the Grand Alliance, the alliance of the Western democracies and the Soviet Union against uh, Hitler's Germany. And there was censorship, not direct, but uh, largely indirect. There was a lot of political agitation. And the Ukrainian uh, uh, organizations in Canada were pretty much compelled, although the government, the Canadian government um, hit, hit it pretty well, the Canadian organizations were compelled to come together and form a Ukrainian-Canadian committee. This Ukrainian-Canadian committee, or KUK as its acronym in Ukrainian goes, was formed in 1940 in the shadow of this grand uh, alliance. And um, um, we know now from, from uh, reading government documents, including RCMP documents, how active the Canadian government was, was behind the scenes in forcing, compelling the Ukrainians to get together. All the non-communist Ukrainians, that is, because the communists were, were not interested in, in, in joining until um, uh, the uh, Soviet Union became uh, uh, an ally. Then suddenly they were all in support of the war. Before that, they were against the war. But in 1941, they changed their policy and they became great uh, anti-fascists, as they called themselves. So um, the war ended and um, a, a new prime minister came to power. And that was Louis Saint Laurent, or Uncle, he was another uncle, un Uncle Louis he was called. Um, and uh, he did a number of things in favor of the Ukrainians. He was not uh, that familiar with them, but he uh, cultivated them because they're a large clientele in the Liberal Party. The Ukrainians in Canada, by and large, before the 1960s, were supporters of the Liberal Party of Canada, by and large. Some supported uh, the CCF, and some supported the communists. Perhaps 10% at most supported the communists. But the vast majority supported the Liberal Party of Canada. So Louis Saint Laurent wanted to keep them on side. And uh, he did a number of things in favor of the Ukrainians. For example, he, point, he appointed uh, Louis Wall, William Wall rather, Volachuk, as the first senator of uh, Ukrainian background in the Canadian Senate. In the, from 1947 to 19, uh, 1947, and especially 1949 to 1952, he welcomed the um, displaced persons from Eastern Europe, uh, and we were concerned with the uh, Ukrainians, and he welcomed approximately 30 to 35,000 uh, Ukrainian refugees uh, to Canada. And he also made an appearance at the uh, most important church of the Ukrainians in Canada, and that was 
Oh, that's funny. Yeah, that's right. Okay, I for forgot to mention this. Um, under, under that pressure um, of the government to toe the line, um, some Ukrainian organizations, which had been vociferous nationalists before the war, were forced to pretty much cease to talk about politics. So what they did was shift from politics to culture. And in 1944, they founded this Center for Ukrainian Education and Culture in Winnipeg called Osoredak, Osored Ukrainskoy Kultury. Um, I forget the rest of it. Um, Osvita, that's right, Osvita, uh, in Winnipeg. And uh, this was a very successful venture, and it grew, 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 and it's still in existence today, and that's a picture of how it appears today. Uh, this pressure ended when the war ended. There's, that's the church um, that uh, he, had, he attended, and he actually took communion in this church. He was a Roman Catholic, but he took communion in the Ukrainian church which was legal according to church law, but was very, very seldom done in those days. Very seldom done. But it was perfectly legal and he did it. And it made a great impression upon the Ukrainians of Canada at that time. And I, I haven't gotten the exact date of this, but I have testimony from Yuri Derevich, Professor Yuri Derevich here in Toronto, who attended that ceremony and, and uh, expressed to me his, his great appreciation for, to Louis Salon, Saint Laurent for doing that. So those are the, the main points that, that uh, are important in that particular prime minister's uh, relations with the Ukrainians. Now the ending of the war um, meant a number of important things. The, the alliance was pretty much at an end. And then uh, the Guzenko case broke out in Ottawa, just shortly after the war ended in Europe. And Guzenko was a uh, Soviet cipher clerk in the embassy in Ottawa who defected with everything that he could carry uh, and went to uh, the, uh, and the offices of, I think it was uh, Minister of Immigration or something like that. But it was the wrong office and he was sent away and he, he told them this is important stuff and you, you should know about it and all of this. It went right to the prime minister. The prime minister says, no, we don't want to hear about that. But his underlings did. They um, welcomed uh, Guzenko, gave him protection, and um, uh, immediately formed the British and the Americans. And that, many people argue, was the beginning of the Cold War. And it happened here in Canada and it happened in Ottawa in particular. That was followed by the uh, Korean War, during which relations became even worse, because it was a hot war you know, on the Asian continent. And relations between Canada and the Soviet Union became very bad. And of course, uh, the Ukrainians were um, uh, deeply affected by the, 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 the most recent immigration. Uh, and they were very much concerned that communism not would not spread. And so it affected them as well. This went on throughout the 1950s to the death of Stalin. The death of Stalin began to change things. Nikita Khrushchev. Oh. Yeah, okay, Diefenbaker. Yeah. Um, now, when... Uh, after uh, the liberals had been in power by this time for a very long time, about 30 years, Louis Saint Laurent is the longest uh, reigning uh, prime minister of Canada in Canadian history. Um, and uh, Saint Laurent uh, replaces him, and then um, Diefenbaker comes to power. He sweeps to power in a grand election, and he is. Uh, very favorable to the Ukrainians. You can see his picture there in the upper right. Uh, one of the main things he did, and something he was uh, very proud of throughout his life, was pass a statute, pass a law in the Parliament of Canada, um, giving everybody civil rights, national rights, and uh, uh, banning discrimination on the basis of national origin, religious origin, ethnic origin, or anything like that. 
This was an enormous step forward for those days. It was criticized. It was criticized by many people, many newspapers, by the opposition, etc., who said that this was not the basic law of the land. This was a mere statute, and another government could come along and change it. Well, that's true, but Canada had no constitution to change. Our constitution was the British North America Act, and that was in, in Britain, not in Canada. So Diefenbaker did everything he could to eliminate discrimination in Canada, which was a serious problem to the earliest immigrants, to the first two waves of immigrants in Canada. Um, and even, uh, to a certain degree, uh, the third uh, wave. But mostly the first two waves who felt it very deeply. So this was important to them. So that's one of the important things that Diefenbaker did. He also um, uh, defended the um, well, teaching of French in Saskatchewan schools, gave native in Indians, as they were called, the vote. This was a tremendous step forward, and that's the reason why they called him the chief, Deef the chief. He used to wear Indian headdress and everything like that, and so he was Deef the chief. People have forgotten that. And uh, he defended the Ukrainians at the United Nations, and we're going to talk about that next. Um, one more point about Diefenbaker. He served in the First World War, came back to Canada as a young lawyer. And immediately after graduating from the university, he went to a little town called Wacaw in Saskatchewan. And it, the, the town was primarily Ukrainians, about 90% Ukrainians. And uh, there you see he joined the local uh, soccer team. And he's the, the third third gentleman from the left there, John Diefenbaker in the Ukrainian soccer team. Now, from John Diefenbaker, we go on to Nikita Khrushchev. <coughs> Khrushchev, <coughs> well, I should say first, Canada-USSR relations generally these became, continued to be frigid to the death of Stalin in 1953. But with Stalin's demise, a power struggle ensued in the Kremlin. The entire Politburo feared and loathed Lavrenti Beria, a Georgian-like Stalin, who was its NKVD secret police chief. Significantly, Beria made a play for power by cultivating the support of non-Russian Soviet nationalities like the Ukrainians. But he was quickly outmaneuvered by the former head of the Communist Party of Ukraine, Nikita Khrushchev, who, with, his, with the support of Soviet war hero General Zhukov, managed to oust Beria, who was immediately taken out and later shot. Within a short time, Khrushchev emerged as the supreme leader of the USSR. Khrushchev had been closely associated with Ukraine throughout most of his political career, and it was rumored and believed by many, both Soviet citizens and outsiders, that he was of Ukrainian background. In fact, he had been born outside the territory that became Soviet Ukraine, but close to its border, perhaps of Ukrainian parents. In the 1930s, while in charge of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, he had overseen the Stalin purges there and was known as a merciless apparatchik. He had headed the Republic during the Second World War and with the advance of the Red Army in 1944, oversaw the annexation of Western Ukraine. His second wife was Ukrainian and he also advocated annexation of, to his fiefdom of her native home, or Helm in Polish, district and organized a letter-writing campaign from Kiev to Moscow that supported this. But such action violated Stalin's plan for the Western move of Soviet borders only as far as the Curzon line, where they are today, actually. And was uh, the, the border still there, rather, not the Soviet Union, to the Curzon line, and was rejected. When Khrushchev was transferred to Moscow, he brought with him some of his Ukrainian supporters, and he maintained close relations with those who remained behind. These included Nikolai Podgorny, Mykola Pyrdhyrny in Ukrainian, 
and Leonid Brezhnev, an ethnic Russian, perhaps like Khrushchev himself, but we don't really know. By 1956, Khrushchev's secret speech to the party's 20th Congress was geared uh, to partly dismantle the Stalin terror that had been long uh, in place over the situation and the party, as well as in those of the Soviet um, satellite states in Eastern Europe and held it all, all this area in its firm grip. But the new leader did not remotely dismantle the, the communist dictatorship. The dreaded NKVD political police, now renamed the KGB, remained intact. And the 1956 uprisings in Poland and Hungary were firmly put down. The world was still largely divided into a democratic West and a communist East Bloc of countries. And they were shortly to face each other down at the United Nations General Assembly in New York City, in Germany, and in Cuba. Nevertheless, both sides made repeated attempts to reduce international tensions and avoid a new global war, which would mean, which would mean a nuclear conflagration. So in 1959, US President Eisenhower even invited Khrushchev to visit the United States. Khrushchev accepted and toured various American cities from New York to Los Angeles. He also wished to visit Canada, but Diefenbaker was cool to the idea, and Khrushchev never stepped onto Canadian soil. Still, the US visit went well, and Khrushchev managed to charm much of the American public by his outgoing and emotionally expressive personality. Shortly afterwards, however, relations suddenly took a turn for the worse. The Soviets managed to shoot down an American U-2 spy plane flying over the USSR, and the Soviet leader was determined to use this incident to embarrass the Soviet Union on the world stage, so to embarrass the Americans, rather, on the world stage. The captured pilot was displayed on Soviet television and seen across the world. And a subsequent summit in Paris went very, very badly. Canada backed the Americans in this matter, which Khrushchev certainly would not have liked. Nevertheless, the parties agreed to meet again at the 15th session of the General Assembly of the United Nations in New York City in September 1960. Cold War clash. Khrushchev came to New York with a plan and a program. Many new countries, former European colonies, had acquired national in <clears throat> independence in the years after 1945. Some of these former colonies, <clears throat> led by India, were beginning to form a new, more non-aligned constituency within the UN. Still others were in the process of acquiring similar independence and the question of colonization and decolonization was in the air. Khrushchev wished to use this situation to Soviet advantage by appealing to these countries and so gain a West majority of seats in the General Assembly, anti-West majority in the seats of the General Assembly. He wanted decolonization to, to be put on the agenda of the Assembly. In September, the world's leaders met in New York Disturbances broke out in the formerly Belgian Congo, and the new leader, its new leader, Patrice Lumumba, was killed. <coughs> Khrushchev, Khrushchev held the West, the, Belgium, the Belgians, and the UN General Secretary, Dag Hammarskjöld, responsible for this tragedy. And in statements to the press, and in a fiery speech to the Assembly, condemned the West, demanded complete disarmament, pointed to the u incident, and bragged about communist achievements in Soviet Central Asia, while well, Africa, as he put it, was, quote, bubbling and seething like a volcano in its struggles against Western colonialism and imperialism. He listed several African countries, rest West Irian, which was the western half of New Guinea, and even US governing Puerto Rico as oppressed nations. The speech aroused considerable applause in the hall and made headlines around the world. In Canada, it was featured in the next day's issue of Toronto's Globe and Mail, 
These bellicose accusations required an immediate Western response. Now, as it turned out, neither President Eisenhower nor Britain's Harold Macmillan, but rather Canada's John Diefenbaker, who was the next Western speaker, uh, speaker to, to stand up. It fell, him, it fell to him to reply to Khrushchev. He did so with relish. His speech was well planned and set out in some detail his fundamental ideals, ideals about Soviet rule. He addressed the issue of colonialism in both the so-called Third World and in Eastern Europe. And there we have Diefenbaker at the UN with his uh, foreign minister, Green. <clears throat> However, Diefenbaker was criticized by officials in the Department of External Affairs, which was the Canadian Foreign Ministry. That's what it's still called today. These unnamed officials strongly discouraged any mention whatsoever of the national question and the Ukrainian question in particular that Khrushchev had faced across his entire career and which only recently had nearly cost him his life at the hands of NKVD uh, Chief Beria. But those Canadian officials seemed to know nothing whatsoever about such matters. At the same time, Diefenbaker, attuned as he was to the Ukrainian question, could clearly see through Khrushchev's ploy and was resolved to expose it and turn the whole decolonization question against the Soviet Union itself. The relevant parts of his speech read as follows. I turn now to the subject <coughs> dealt with at great length by the chairman of the Council of Ministers of the USSR, Nikita Khrushchev, on the subject of colonialism. He asked for and advocated a declaration at this session for the complete and final elimination of colonial regimes. I think it could be generally agreed that whatever the experience of the past, there can no longer be a relationship of master and servant anywhere in the world. He has spoken of colonial bondage, of exploitation and foreign yokes. Those views uttered by the master of the major colonial power in the world today, the USSR, followed by the admission of 14 new members to the United Nations, all of them former European colonies, I pause to ask this question. How many human beings have been liberated by the USSR? Do we forget how Hungary, one of the post-war colonies of the Soviet Union sought to liberate, liberate itself four years ago, and with what results? I say that because these facts of history in the Commonwealth and other countries invite comparison with the domination of, over peoples and territories, sometimes gained under the guise of liberation, but always accompanied by the loss of political freedom. What of Lithuania? Estonia, Latvia. What about the freedom-loving Ukrainians and many other Eastern European peoples, which I shall not list for fear of omitting some of them? There can be no double standard in international affairs. I ask the Chairman of the Council of Ministers of the USSR to give these nations under his domination the right of free elections under genuinely free conditions. If those conclusions were what his words meant, they must apply universally. Then indeed, there will be new action to carry out the obligations of the United Nations Charter. Then indeed, there will be new hope for all mankind. My hope is that his words will be universally acceptable and that he will give the lead towards their implementation here and now. Diefenbaker closed with a brief synopsis of Canada's mo modest place in the world, a middle power responsible but threatening no one, a country with roots in two European powers, Britain and France, but made up of, quote, all races of men who have come to us.
Now the reaction to Diefenbaker's powerful speech. The speech aroused general applause in, this, in the assembly. Though the Soviet representative, Valerian, Valerian Zorin, walked out in the middle of it. Both Khrushchev and Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko had demonstratively boycotted it to attend a luncheon given by the Canadian financier Cyrus Eaton, skin of one of the country's most prominent families, who was well known for his peacemaking efforts and had just received the Soviet Union's Lenin Prize for strengthening peace. But Dief had succeeded in turning the Cold War aspect of colonialism and imperialism on its head by accusing the USSR of being imperialism's most aggressive agent. He had listed the aggrieved nations of Eastern Europe one by one and ended in a great crescendo with the freedom-loving Ukrainians, a dig that was both a direct response to Khrushchev's interference in American internal affairs by calling Puerto Rico an oppressed colony, and by answering the demand of Ukrainian Canadians that their government do something to state the injustice, the, the justice of their cause and their moral superiority over the Soviet and pro-communist ideological foes. In fact, there is some evidence that the Reverend Vasil Kushnir, president of the Umbrella Ukrainian Canadian Committee, and there you see him, Kushnir, on the right with the glasses. Um, president of the Ukrainian Canadian Committee and a personal friend of Diefenbaker. Diefenbaker uh, sometimes even called him up on the telephone and chatted with him. Um, had been one of the strongest advocates of the Prime Minister discussing Ukraine in this historic address. On the other hand, it was quite clear to all that mere mention of the Ukrainian question went down badly with the Mandarins in external at Ottawa and with Canadian diplomats elsewhere, and also most probably with the former Canadian diplomat, Nobel Peace Prize winner, and presently leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition, Lester B. Pearson, after whom those Mandarins were scathingly labeled, and I think probably uh, by Diefenbaker himself, as <coughs> Pearsonalities. Moreover, beyond the UN building in New York, Dief's speech made a varied reception. Although both Eisenhower and Macmillan congratulated on it, him on it, the latter and the latter was, as Diefenbaker later recalled, downright glowing in his praise, on the very same day that he delivered it, Kennedy debated Nixon on American TV. Consequently, the American media simply ignored the Prime Minister's speech. By contrast, Canadian newspapers and the, the Ukrainian language press, both in the USA and in Canada, were exuberant in their praise. New York's Ukrainian Weekly, Winnipeg's Nové Shlach, Toronto's Vilnius Slovo, all agreed that the speech was a bombshell that strove to break the silence over the Ukrainian question. Toronto's Globe and Mail, too, was positive. Munich-based Radio Free Europe immediately broadcast it into Eastern Europe in both Ukrainian and in Russian, where, judging by the Soviet government's vociferous response, it instantly became a sensation. The text even filtered across the USSR to the snows of Siberia and reached across the barbed wire fences into the gulag to echo among the numerous prisoners there becoming, as one of its most prominent inmates, the Ukrainian churchman, Joseph Cardinal Slipay, was later quoted as saying, quote, the greatest moral support ever received by political prisoners in Soviet Russia, unquote. I have a footnote on this, actually. I think the Globe and Mail misquoted him. He probably said political prisoners in the Soviet Union because the, point, the entire point of Diefenbaker's speech was there were nations in the Soviet Union. There was not one nation, there were many nations, and some of them were dissatisfied with the status quo and were not given the right to express it. <clears throat> um, 
Yes. So um, the Soviets reacted as well, very vociferously. Khrushchev, of course, had the exact opposite reaction. His behavior suddenly became more boisterous, erratic, more abusive than decorative than, than, of decorum than ever. His major American biographer, William Taubman, described it as that of, quote, a whirling dervish. He came close to physically knocking Diefenbaker by the shoulder while passing him in the hallway, repeatedly interrupted Macmillan when he spoke a few days later, and simply went berserk when a later speaker repeated Diefenbaker's remarks. That was the famous incident where he took off his shoe and banged it on his desk in protest, while the entire Soviet and communist de 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 delegations shouted and pounded their desks with their fists. In a confidential KGB newsletter that went out to various KGB offices across the Soviet Union, Major General N. Zakharov, who was a member of the Soviet delegation, explained that Khrushchev's boisterous antics at the United Nation were meant to break through the public relations boycott of Khrushchev in New York. Zakharov accused the American State Department of organizing this boycott, this supposed boycott, and being behind the many anti-communist demonstrations, especially by Ukrainians and Hungarians. But the Major General did not care or dare to mention anything about shoe banging or the other obtrusive antics of the Soviet and other communist delegations in the UN's assembly hall, and only quoted the Western press when it remarked upon Khrushchev's importance. Now, this is an interesting uh, point, actually, because this was published uh, in a secret, uh, confidential, secret uh, newsletter that went out to all KGB offices across the Soviet Union. And um, I got this document um, from Kiev recently, and the um, Security Service of Ukraine has control of the KGB archives there in Ukraine. And um, this particular document uh, was discovered there. And uh, the, the, the um, Security Service of Ukraine wants to publicize uh, this era, the Soviet era, to show up, show the other side of the Soviet Union. So there's a lot of documents like that. Um, I have only acquired a few so far, but there are many, many more to come, I believe. So this is ongoing, and if uh, Ukraine remains independent and we continue to have our own government, there will be a lot more coming forth, I'm sure. Now, Khrushchev immediately ordered Nikolai Podgorny, head of the uh, Ukrainian SSR delegation, because it had its own delegation, to directly reply to D Diefenbaker in the Ukrainian language. And the head of the Belarusian de uh, delegation, Mazurov, to do the same in Belarusian. As it turned out, Mazurov could not even speak Belarusian. But Pidhirny, to quote the Ukrainian form of his name, personally attacked Diefenbaker, accused him of posing as a false liberator of Ukraine, referred but only once to the Ukrainian SSR's sovereign status, and ended by pointing to the many Ukrainian farmers and workers in Canada who had served that country well and might be a basis for improved relations between Canada and the USSR. Pidhirny's speech, in fact, seems to have been the first time that the Ukrainian language was ever spoken from the podium of the United Nations General Assembly in New York City. <clears throat> Russian to then being the incumbent language used by Soviet diplomats. Ignored by the mainstream North American press, and even by the emigre Ukrainian press here in Canada and elsewhere, it was, however, printed out in full by the pro-communist Ukrainian newspapers in Canada, that is, those of the Ukrainian labor temple movement. Simultaneously, authorities in Soviet Ukraine organized mass demonstrations about, against Stephen Baker in Kiev, Lviv, Kharkiv, and other Ukrainian cities. There can be no doubt that the prime minister had made a splash that extended well beyond the usually restrained diplomatic circles in New York, 
Washington and elsewhere. However, it would be wrong to call Diefenbaker a cold warrior on account of his support for free elections in the communist bloc and for an independent Ukraine. He continued to advocate peaceful Canada-USSR trade relations, arranged for new grain sales to both communist China and the Soviets, was unenthusiastic about Kennedy's handling of the Cuban Missile Crisis. In contrast to his warm admiration to Eisenhower, for Eisenhower, his relations with Kennedy thereafter became decidedly cool. Within Canada, he closed the Avril Arrow program for new RCAF fighter jets, and he never advocated nuclear weapons on Canadian soil. Despite his reputation as a populist and his faith in declarative statements of principle, such as his UN speech, he remained realistic about changing world affairs. When he eventually lost re-election to Lester Pearson, the old policies of ignoring the Ukrainian question returned and Canadian policy towards the Soviet Union reverted to standard diplomatic decorum. The next Prime Minister was Lester B. Pearson. During Pearson's time, East-West relations were strained by American intervention in the Vietnam War, which grew in intensity over the course of several years. Canada, however, true to Pearsonian theories of Canadian statecraft, stood aside from the conflict and was a member of the International Commission geared to ending it peacefully. Under Pearson, Canadian wheat sales to the USSR that had been engineered by Diefenbaker were carried through. Moreover, Canada's cautious policy towards the Vietnam conflict helped to make possible the USSR's significant participation in Expo 67, the World's Fair held in Montreal. The competition for the fair had been won by the USSR, but in April 1960, the Soviets withdrew their bid, citing security and financial concerns. The Diefenbaker government firmly supported Montreal's bid, and the city won the competition. The fair was held in Montreal. The public, and myself actually, quite naturally compared the American exhibit to the Soviet and found that while the Americans had the more impressive building design, the Soviets had the fuller interior, stressing their important contribution to the space race, which was still in progress in 1967. That year, of course, marked the centenary of the Canadian Confederation and the 50th anniversary of the Russian Revolution. The Soviet, Canadian, and American pavilions were all very well uh, attended. Specifically on the Ukrainian question, under Pearson, external affairs returned to its traditional aloofness to the whole matter. Department veterans such as George Ignatiev, a Russian emigre of aristocratic ancestry, who was a colleague of Pearson, would later paint the question as one of a simple search for peace. In his memoirs, Ignatiev was critical of Diefenbaker, but absolutely scathing on Khrushchev, describing his bad matters as those of, quote, a Ukrainian peasant. This outrageous remark, at least in the eyes of Ukrainian Canadians, both communist and anti-communist, completely ignored the fact that Khrushchev had left his village as a boy and grew up an industrial worker in the denationalized Donbass. But it does say something about diplomat Ignatiev's views of the Ukrainian question. More circumspect was the opinion of Canada's UN ambassador, Charles Ritchie, who in his account of September-October 1960 at the UN hardly mentioned Diefenbaker and Khrushchev at all. Ritchie also ignored Petirny's follow-up, which was aimed directly at Diefenbaker, Canada, and its Ukrainian communities, both nationalist and non-communist, and pro-communist, rather. Pidhirny has suggested that the latter would be a good bridge between the two con countries, but his speech was ignored at the time, and diplomatic historians have forgotten it ever since. And I think this is a grave error, really. <clears throat> 
It was an important speech, direct uh, attack on Canada, on Diefenbaker, and everybody ignores it. Why did they ignore it? Even the Ukrainians in Canada, the, the non-communist Ukrainians in Canada, all of the newspapers ignored it. You know, uh, By contrast, I looked at the communist newspapers, the pro-communist newspapers, the Labour Temple ones, big articles about Pete Hirney everywhere in his speech, first time speaking Ukrainian at the UN, all this sort of thing. So it's a kind of an irony of history that this, uh, this uh, defense of the Soviet Union actually uh, was uh, greeted by, by, um, by the, the, the attack on the Soviet Union and the defense were greeted by both groups of Ukrainians in Canada, Diefenbaker by the non-communists and Pidhirne by the communists. The year 1968 augured many changes, though few of them seemed to directly affect Canada-USSR relations and Ukrainian affairs. The Vietnam War reached its climax that year. Demonstrations against it shook university campuses across the USA. In Czechoslovakia, the Prague Spring sought to give socialism a human face. There was a general strike in France. The socialist leader, Rudy Duchke, was assassinated in West Germany. First the, the, uh, first, the human rights leader, Martin Luther King, and then the presidential candidate, Robert Kennedy, were both assassinated. General elections brought Richard Nixon to power in the US and Pierre Elliott Trudeau to power in Canada. And finally, the Soviets with their tanks invaded defiant Czechoslovakia, arrested the Czech leader, Alexander Dubček, and by force put down socialism with a human face. <clears throat> There you have it, Montreal World's Fair. That's the Canadian Pavilion. It was the largest, several buildings. By contrast, the Americans had one building, the Soviets had one building. All three were well attended. Big event in Canadian history. And in world history, I think. Next comes Pierre Elliott Trudeau, the very next year, elected leader of the Liberal Party of Canada. Trudeau's election in Canada was partly a result of this center-left move in world opinion and in Canadian politics, and a spike in Canadian nationalism in particular. But the new prime minister was theoretically opposed to nationalisms of all sorts, especially the kind that sought independence for his native province of Quebec. Indeed, he seemed to espouse a loose sort of internationalism that inter innocently accepted communist claims to promote such internationalism. And he wished to improve relations between the Soviet bloc and the West. As a young man, he had visited and sympathized with Red China, not even noticing or reporting that Chairman Mao's great leap forward was made at the cost of a massive famine modeled on, modeled on Stalin's actions in Ukraine some two decades earlier. That famine, man-made, as was frequently said, had cost millions of innocent lives, at a bare minimum over four million in the case of Ukraine, probably 10 times that in the case of China. In absolute terms, scholars believe that this might have been the greatest famine in human history. So shortly after Trudeau's election victory, Canada was almost silent about the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia despite considerable sympathy for the Dubček reforms among the Canadian public, and especially democratic socialists, NDP types here in Canada. And afterwards, when Biafra in, Af in Africa and East Timor in the Pacific sought national independence from Nigeria and Indonesia respectively, Trudeau remained indifferent. Though pictures of starving Biafrans, the Igbo people, being blockaded by the Nigerian government arouse much compassion among Canadians, and the people of East Timor, being partly a Catholic minority and majority um, Muslim Indonesia, pulled at the conscience of many Canadians. At the time, there were few African or Pacific Island Canadians to protest Trudeau's inaction on these matters. The situation of the Ukrainians was different. From the start, Trudeau moved to improve Canada-USSR relations, and it was only the invasion of Czechoslovakia 
and the 1970 October crisis in Quebec that delayed an exchange of state visits. But by the spring of 1971, Trudeau and his new wife, Margaret, stepped off their plane onto Soviet soil. Toronto Liberal MP Walter Deakin, a Ukrainian-Canadian, came along as a Prime Minister's translator. <clears throat> In Moscow, Trudeau had extensive conversations with the Soviet leaders Leonid Brezhnev, Alexei Kosygin, and that same Podgorny, or rather Pithirny, who had earlier de attacked Diefenbaker at the United Nations. Documents on trade and exchanges were signed. From Moscow, the prime ministerial uh, couple flew on to Kiev. Um, so there you have Pierre Trudeau and his wife Margaret, who had just been married. This is almost their honeymoon flying off to the Soviet Union, going to Moscow first, and followed by uh, a trip to Kiev to visit Soviet Ukraine. You see that uh, Margaret there is wearing a huska, or babushka as we used to call them. And this, I believe, was uh, done on purpose, so she could identify with Soviet women, Soviet Ukrainian women. And Trudeau, of course, with his uh, suit and his red rose in his lapel. Uh, there's some speculation about what that meant. <laughs> Could have been just fashion. Maybe it was something else. We don't know. Um, but there they are. Margaret herself was completely non-political, only vaguely representing Western youth, but was very, very popular. In fact, uh, Trudeau was approached several times and complimented on his beautiful wife and asked how this happened. And uh, they were quite stunned by Margaret in general. So anyhow, in Kiev, Trudeau did not meet with the uh, first secretary of the Communist Party, Petro Shellist, but he did meet with the Ukrainian Premier, Vladimir Sherbitsky, had a tour of the city, laid a wreath to the victims of the Great Patri Patriotic War, as the Soviets called the Second World War, and with his wife, Margaret, and translator, Walter Deacon, who was an MP from uh, Toronto, here in Toronto, this area, actually, just southeast of here, attended a large banquet in his honor. And as I have said, he did not meet with Petro Shellist. And when Deacon translated the prime minister's words into Ukrainian for the Ukrainians, the Soviet Ukrainians, according to Moscow's rules, dutifully replied only in Russian. Though Trudeau seemed to be completely unaware of it, this was roughly the equivalent of replying to French-speaking President Charles de Gaulle only in English on his state visit to French-speaking Quebec City. It was hardly conducive to favoring local interests over central ones. In fact, Trudeau seemed to be completely oblivious to the power struggle then going on between Sherbitsky, who supported Moscow, and Shellist, who was a communist, but a Ukrainian patriot of sorts. In fact, the very next year, Moscow carried out a large purge of the Communist Party of Ukraine and of the Ukrainian intelligentsia. Some dissidents were sent to the Gulag, others were fired from their jobs, journals were closed, and Shellist lost his position and was safely, for the Russifiers in Ukraine, exiled to Moscow. Trudeau's attitude to the Ukrainians on the surface as elites did not seem to have helped the Kiev Ukrainians in any way. In fact, his Kiev speech even stated that he would, quote, seize the opportunity to learn as much as I can of the way your local governments deal with the kinds of problems that face the provinces of Canada. Subsequently, of course, this was simply shocking in view of the mass purges of the Ukrainian officials and intellectuals that followed. But even then, Canadian journalist Charles Lynch, who was part of the Prime Minister's entourage, reported the warm reception and wrote that, quote, never before had a Canadian Prime Minister 
being so sympathetic or uncritical of the USSR. And later, when Trudeau visited the Soviet Arctic and uh, praised how the Soviets had developed it, especially the city of Norilsk, he seemed to be completely innocent of the fact that that town had been constructed entirely by the slave labor <clears throat> of, of the Gulag prisoners, mostly Ukrainians, and of the important strike or uprising of these prisoners some two decades before. News of Trudeau's Norilsk remarks filtered across the barbed wire, fire, wire fences into the still existing Gulag, and, you, and the Russian political dissident Andrei Amalrik, then still in captivity, later sarcastically commented them on them in his <coughs> memoirs. More significantly for Canadian politics, when these remarks were reported back in Canada, they caused an immediate uproar in Parliament and in the press. Later, Trudeau tried to defend himself in Parliament, but only got into more hot water by equating Ukrainian dissidents who supported the democratic reforms and the rule of law with FLQ terrorists who had, all, who had already given up on parliamentary methods and turned to political violence. In the summer of 1971, Trudeau felt compelled to meet with representatives of the Ukrainian community, where he tried to mend fences and apologized for hurting their feelings. But despite CBC and press reports to the contrary, he did not take back this scornful comparison. And that's what this uh, meeting here is about. This is taken from Ukrainsky Holos, uh, Winnipeg newspaper describing the meeting between the Prime Minister and the Ukrainian delegation. Um, Professor Derevich was a member of that delegation. Professor Manupol from um, Edmonton was a member of that delegation. There was another member from Toronto whose name I forget, I think it was Maximich or something like that. Um, when they came out of the meeting, uh, so I was told, um, the press immediately pounced on, on Kushnir and asked him, well, what happened at this meeting? And Kushnir didn't know quite what to say and was sort of mumbling something. And um, so the press turned to, to um, Anthony, Anthony, somebody from Winnipeg, another member of the, um, of the delegation. And he didn't know quite what to say either because you know the prime minister refused to take back his marks. Said, "I'm sorry for hurting your feelings, but you know this is the way it is." You know, and then this gentleman from Toronto stepped forward and said, "Oh yes, the prime minister apologized, no. completely apologized," and the and this was the news spread across the whole country. So um, there you have it. Now all these events were closely followed by agents of the KGB which reported on them to the Communist Party leadership back in Moscow and in Kiev. In his communications, the Ukrainian KGB chief, Fedor Chuk, did not ignore Charles Lynch's positive assessment of Trudeau's visit to the Soviet Union, quoted parts, and seemed to swallow the story about Trudeau apologizing to the Ukrainian delegation in Canada. At least he did not question it. In a separate report, he also reported Lynch as writing that it would be too much to say that Trudeau was greeted as a hero in the Soviet Union, Trudeau polochil status Goroya, but the fact, but the fact that the whole country welcomed him was true. Fedorchuk added that the KGB, quote, through secret service method, methods, Chekesky Amira, had blocked two citizens of Kiev with letters expressing their wish to emigrate to Canada from approaching the Canadian delegation. So even the KGB was fooled by, by this story that Trudeau, Trudeau apologized. Trudeau's multiculturalism move. Meanwhile, the national question in Canada itself was in the process of changing. In the early 1960s, Prime Minister Pearson form, had formed a Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism to examine the state of the nation, and as a concession to Canadian minorities, had appointed to it 
the Ukrainian-Canadian linguist from the University of Manitoba, J.B. Runitsky. Together with the Ukrainian Paul Yuzik, who had previously been appointed to the Senate by Diefenbaker, and to a lesser extent, a Polish representative on, on, of the, on the commission, a scholar of French-Canadian literature named Paul Wyczynski. These colleagues outlined the groundwork for a new federal policy of multiculturalism. The Ukrainians who had, pressed ma ma who had presented many important briefs to the Royal Commission adopted the idea enthusiastically. In fact, they became by far the most outspoken Canadian minority group promoting it. These different issues, two different issues, multiculturalism versus bilingualism on the one hand, and Canadian policy towards the USS, USSR's Ukrainian question on the other, came together in the summer of 1971. The new Prime Minister, who had already captured the admiration of much of the country for his bravery before the threats of FLQ terrorism, had to somehow resolve both pressing questions. At the core of these stood a united Ukrainian-Canadian community making clear and unequivocal demands upon him. <clears throat> In fact, mass demonstrations against his soft on Russia policies were seen as a real threat to impede and disorient the plan planned fall visit to Canada of Soviet leader Kosygin. Trudeau decided to face the two problems simultaneously. He devised a new federal policy of multiculturalism within a bilingual framework and arranged to announce it in Parliament and then repeat it with some embellishments the very next day before the great Ukrainian-Canadian Congress to be held in Winnipeg. This Congress preceded Kosygin's state, uh, state visit to Canada by a mere couple of weeks. Kosygin's tour was geared to have been the Soviet counterpart to Trudeau's tour of the Soviet Union. During these events, the new theme of friendly northern neighbors took on a firmer shape. The announcement in Parliament of the new multiculturalism policy went well, and all major par parties supported it. However, the Ukrainians kept up the pressure against the opening to the USSR, and they continued to stress the plight of political prisoners there. Confronted by Ukrainian student demonstrators in Winnipeg, Trudeau promised that he would bring up the matter with Kosygin, but only as a humanitarian and not a political matter. This somewhat ameliorated, ameliorated uh, Ukrainian hostility towards his recent international moves. But when he spoke at the Congress in Winnipeg, his multicultural announcement, together with a statement that he would talk to Kosygin about political prisoners, was greeted enthusiastically. And there you have Kandidiski Farmer's uh, front page describing the Congress with, um, and also the uh, tour of, uh, of, of, of Kosygin and all that sort of thing. Uh, the Congress, uh, by this time, uh, Kushnir had been the head of the committee for over 30 years, you know, 1940 to 1971. And there was a revolt within the ranks of the Ukrainian-Canadian Congress against him. The younger folk wanted new, new people, and they got it. They got a promise from the executive that it would change the, the following year. So that's what that headline is about. Below it, you see the headline that's uh, saying that Trudeau will speak to Kosygin when he comes to Canada about political prisoners, you know, giving them further freedoms. And those two policies, together with multiculturalism, um, were in the air at that time. And all this happened in October of 1971 when I was away in Europe and I missed the whole thing, <laughs> unfortunately. So, um, of course, this, um, 
did not prevent this enthusiasm for Trudeau, and it was really enthusiastic, did not uh, prevent more experienced and um, jaded observers from thinking that Trudeau's concession on the multiculturalism question was meant to calm the Ukrainians down just before Kursigan's visit. And uh, we know that uh, Manoli Rupel actually wrote about this in his memoirs. At this same Congress, Trudeau was greeted, as I said, ecstatically. Um, and there you see uh, uh, Senator Paul Yuzik presenting the Prime Minister with a copy of Ukraine, a concise encyclopedia, basic textbook published by the University of Toronto Press. Very, very important at the time. And um, the, um, the newspaper um, sort of sarcastically notes, so that he will know Ukraine better. Because his uh, excuse always was, he was told, well, there's prisoners there. There's, they don't have rights like we have. You should speak about it. He says, well, I don't know any about, about anything about this. So they're saying here, you should know better. Now you'll know better. <clears throat> now, Kosygin did come to Canada, as any of you who have lived in Toronto over the years know. And the next section of this paper I title, The Kosygin Catastrophe and Northern Neighbours. As it turned out, that visit went off very roughly. Anti-communist protesters, which included large numbers of Ukrainian Canadians, Jews slanting the, uh, chanting the slogan, let my people go, and other East Europeans demonstrated vociferously against Kosygin everywhere he went. In Ottawa, he was almost brought to his knees by a Hungarian protester who jumped on top of him before the Houses of Parliament. And that's the incident right there, you see it. You can see him being brought down by this fellow jumping on top of him. Not a very good picture, but it's the only one I could find. Um, in Toronto, he had to virtually hide from the large crowds of pro protesters that followed him everywhere. In Ottawa, bombs were discovered near the Soviet embassy. In Toronto, a great confrontation occurred near, before the Science Centre, where mounted city police rode into the excited crowds and caused many injuries. Arrests, lawsuits, and a well-publicized provincial inquiry followed. During those stormy days in October 1971, on the popular level at least, Canadian and Soviet relations, despite official government pronouncements, seemed to have reached a real low point. <clears throat> and this was international news, and American papers covered it including the Christian Science Monitor. And there you see, um, as reprint, reprinted in uh, Kennedysky Farmer, a cartoon from the Christian Science Monitor, which shows Trudeau and Kosygin limping along, uh, obviously injured by the bombs, explosions, shrapnel, whatnot, exploding all around them. And you have different uh, issues array, raised by this. Hungarian protest, of course. Quebec separatist movement, air hijacking, I'm not sure what that's referring to, Jewish protest, and in the top left-hand corner you see minority squabbles, which is the issue of biculturalism versus multiculturalism. <clears throat> Nevertheless, the Northern Nathers concept enjoyed some successes. Documents were signed confirming future academic, cultural, and sporting exchanges, and most of these did touch Ukrainian Canadians. Perhaps the most high-profile exchange was the Canada-USSR hockey series of 1972, which quickly captured the imagination of the entire country. Ukrainian students protested the games, but did so rather cleverly. For example, a group in Winnipeg held up signs in the stadium saying in English, Welcome Soviets, on one side. And on the other side, Freedom for Moroz, 
freedom for political uh, prisoner Valentin Moroz. This enraged the political minders of the Soviet team, who could read the Ukrainian but not the English. And it simply confused the stadium officials, who could read the English but not the Ukrainian. The game had to be held up for a top while by the, while the matter was straightened out. And this did bring some renewed attention to the issue of Ukrainian political prisoners in the Soviet Union. Early in 1975, a great exhibit of Soviet art toured the country. Again, it brought out some demonstrators, but again, it was a success. Acute observers, however, could notice that the exhibit featured Russian and not necessarily Soviet art, and so ignored the Ukrainian and other non-Russian peoples of the USSR. Most noticeable was a large picture of Leo Tolstoy, Tolstoy barefoot, bossy, by the Ukrainian origin artist Ilya Repin, then generally labeled a Russian. This could hardly have been unpremeditated. None of Repin's Ukrainian-themed paintings were included, though the exhibit was shown in Winnipeg, then the unofficial Ukrainian capital of Canada, a bald fact of which the Soviets most certainly were aware. In the academic sphere, exchanges eventually included a standing agreement between the University of Saskatchewan and Chernivtsi University in Soviet Ukraine. The locales of these institutions were significant. Saskatchewan was at the heart of the old non-political Ukrainian immigrant settlements, while Chernivtsi, traditionally Eastern Orthodox and less passionately nationalistic than old Greek Catholic Galicia, was still close to the European heartland of that same non-political immigration. This exchange agreement was to continue for at least four decades. Moreover, during this period, several Canadian ethnics as tr entered Trudeau cabinets, and Ontario MP Norm Kafik, a Ukraine Canadian whom the KGB considered a well-known anti-Soviet, was appointed the first full-fledged Minister of Cult State for Multiculturalism. After the conservative Mike Starr, he was the second such Ukrainian to hold a full cabinet post, federal cabinet post. Finally, in 1975, the Trudeau, Trudeau government signed the Helsinki Accords, which sought to preserve peace in Europe through extending the American policy of detente or relaxation of tensions. In the view of the Soviets, this would ensure their post-war territorial gains, while in the view of the West, it confirmed the general principle of human rights across the European continent. Shortly, Helsinki monitoring groups were founded in various countries, including Soviet Ukraine, which was, of course, noted and publicized by supporting Ukrainian activists in Canada. This complemented and strengthened the work of international human rights organization, Amnesty International, which defended the rights of prisoners of conscience everywhere, including now also Ukraine. These included General Petro Rihorenko, Vyacheslav Chornovil, and many others, who thereafter became well known in Canada. In fact, progressive conservative Senator Paul Yuzik was instrumental in publicizing and distributing Chornovil's documents on the suppression of Ukrainian legal rights in the Soviet Union. And Toronto resident Kristina Izayev was active in promoting such rights across the 1970s and 1980s. Izayev notes that after 1975, she personally pushed for the inclusion of Soviet dissidents into the Amnesty International program which had per previously centered mostly on human rights in Latin America. But across the entire Trudeau era, the Ukrainian question was never a priority for the government. And then we have another election, and along comes Brian Mulroney. The retirement of Trudeau and his eventual replacement by progressive conservative Brian Mulroney finally brought a reversal of the same of some of this pro-Soviet feeling in the Canadian government. Though there was no entirely new policy shift, and exchanges such as that at the University of Saskatchewan continued. 
Mulroney, in his youth, had been an admirer of Diefenbaker, and his wife was of Slavic background, a Serbian. Like Diefenbaker, he was better attuned to East European affairs than Trudeau had been. And he was openly friendly to the Ukrainian Canadians, who in the cases of both Trudeau and Diefenbaker, welcomed him to their conventions. Shortly before his first election win, Mulroney even attended a meeting of the World Congress of Free Ukrainians here in Toronto. After Mulroney won election, he acted on both the multicultural and USSR files. His idea was to shift from government grants to ethnic groups, which had been liberal policy, though very weakly carried out, to the appointment of ethnic Canadians to more government positions. His cabinet contained many Ukrainians or other East European or of other East European backgrounds, the most important of which was Justice Minister Ray Natishin from Saskatchewan, an affable Ukrainian Canadian liked by both Conservatives and Liberals, whom at the start of his second term, Mulroney advised the Queen to appoint Governor General of Canada. As such, Natishin represented the Queen and symbolized Canadian sovereignty. Mulroney's government also seemingly bucked tr bureaucratic tradition in external affairs by hiring Roman Washchuk, a, high, a talented Ukrainian-Canadian educated at the University of Toronto, where he studied with Ukrainian history, where he studied Ukrainian history with Paul Robert Magachi. Mulroney's new moves began to be reflected in government policy when in the USSR when the USSR began its democratic and decentralizing reforms under Mikhail Gorbachev, himself partly of Ukrainian ancestry from the North Caucasus. Canada was the first Western country to recognize uh, Ukrainian independence, second only to formerly communist Poland, Ukraine's immediate neighbor to the West. This recognition followed earlier moves when shortly before Canada had established its long-awaited consulate general in Kiev, and the Prime Minister was appointed the quiet diplomat, Ukrainian-Canadian Nestor Gayovsky, its first chargé d'affaires in uh, Kiev. In this way, from the start, Canada enjoyed excellent relations with the new Ukrainian state, the USSR no longer existed, and Canadian policy towards its Ukrainian question came to an end. Now I have a few general conclusions to make. We may conclude that across the 20th century, Canada's policy towards the USSR's Ukrainian question went through several phases. From the early years of indifference, through the anti-Soviet and then pro-Soviet times of the Second World War, Ukrainian affairs were simply not on Canada's foreign policy agenda. This only significantly changed when in 1960, John Diefenbaker declared his support for the freedom-loving Ukrainians at the United Nations. Lester Pearson paid less attention to the Ukrainian question, and the old attitudes of indifference returned. But his successor, Pierre Trudeau, moved from indifference to an admiration of the USSR, and even declared that Canada could use Soviet models. Ukrainian Canadians opposed this, and on the eve of Kosygin's state visit to the Canada, the Prime Minister tried to mollify that community with his new policy of multiculturalism. Most Ukrainian Canadians reacted enthusiastically, but this did not quiet opposition Trudeau, to Trudeau's soft on Russia positions. Brian Mulroney was personally sympathetic to the Ukrainian Canadians and more, named more Canadian ethnics to responsible government posts. Ray Natishin became Governor General of Canada and remains so when, in variance to American policy, Canada was the first Western state to recognize Ukrainian independence. Consequently, the general picture is one of increasing Ukrainian Canadian influence and more sympathy towards the USSR's Ukrainians, ending with good relations with newly independent Ukraine. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.